Hello, my name is Mark Smith. Um, I'm giving a presentation at the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo in August of 2021. Uh, my presentation is on measuring common mode chokes, also known as one-to-one -one balance sometimes, uh, with a nano VNA. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, an introduction. Who am I? Uh, like I said, my name is Mark Smith. My call sign is N6MTS, formerly KR6ZY, uh, with a bunch of other call signs before that. Uh, the best way to get a hold of me is on Twitter. I am Smitty Halibut, S-M-I-T-T-Y-H-A-L-I-B-U-T. And I am a sometimes host of the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. I got into ham radio uh, back in the early 90s, 91, 92-ish, when I was back in high school. And uh, was kind of active during high school, but really active during college. Uh, was a member of the W6BHZ Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club uh, for most of the 90s. Uh, and then I've been active off and on since then as a, as a you know, an adult, a professional. Um, mostly into building things, not so much operating, if I have to be honest. Um, but I like contests, I like field days, I like uh, POTA and SODA and... Um, uh, that kind of fun stuff. And I like talking about it. I like learning and I like experimenting. So uh, let's get on to it. First of all, a disclaimer. I am going to be playing it incredibly fast and loose with the science on this one. Uh, if you want a much more scientific uh, a treatise of balance. I recommend both of these articles. Uh, Ward Silver did an article in Nuts and Volts back in July of 2015 uh, about balance and, and common mode chokes and um, uh, eliminating noise and whatnot, as did uh, Chuck Councilman. And forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, he also did a wonderful article on common mode chokes. Um, links of these, both of these, are in the um, in the slides that you can get after the, the show, or if you can grab a screenshot right here. I will be taking a much more engineering kind of approach, which is I've got an idea, I'm going to build it, and then I'm going to test it, and I'm going to see whether it worked or not, and then I'm going to improve it. I'm going to try something else and see whether it got better or worse, and then I'm just going to keep iterating until I find something that I like. So... These gentlemen wrote great scientific articles going into the, the math and the theory and the physics. I'm doing more of an engineering style approach where I'm building something and trying it and moving on. Um, so what is it that I'm bringing besides just the engineering approach? Well, I am going to be describing how to build a test rig that will help you do these sorts of things spoilers on the screen right now. And I will be actually presenting data, uh, measured data from balance that I have actually built um, and measured. Um, so getting into the theory just a little tiny bit, what is common mode current and why, why are we so concerned about it? Why do we want to build a common mode choke? Well, to know what common mode current is, you kind of have to understand the other si other type of currents, which are called differential mode currents. So in a system, uh, you've got a feed line over here. Could be coax, could be twin lead, could be twisted pair, could be anything. You, something that is feeding power to a load. And if the currents going in on this wire and coming out on this wire are exactly the same then that is called a differential mode current. Differential mode currents are currents that are going in opposite directions on different wires that are balanced, that are the same amount of current going in both directions. And when you do that, all of the currents going in and out of this load are coming in and out of this, this feed line. There's no extra current for it to go anywhere else. There's no imbalanced. That is called a differential mode current. Common mode currents are anything that's left over. Um, like if I1 were a little bit bigger than I2, that would be that difference between the perfectly balanced currents over here uh, shows up as a value on this I1 over here, a common mode current. It's called common mode because it oftentimes if you've got co current going the same direction on both wires, it's common in both wires. Um, in that case, there's no, there's no balance of this current coming the other direction. So Kirchhoff's current law says the sum of the two currents here, one of these may be zero, but whatever current's coming in here, whatever common mode current has to go out through something else, like our ground in this particular case. So the differential mode currents are currents that are in opposite directions and perfectly balanced. Common mode currents are whatever's left over, whatever is not balanced. All right, so question for you. Coax, 
how many conductors are there on a coax cable? Two? Well, if you said three, you are correct. So there may be only two things of copper in your coaxial cable, but there are three different paths that current can take. So because physics, and I'm going to hand wave a lot at this, because physics, any current on your center conductor necessarily is balanced by an, an opposing current on the inside of the shield of your coax. So the current on the center conductor and the current on the inside of your shield are necessarily balanced. Physics says it is. It has to do with induced currents and fields and things. Um, and so the the normal mode we think of for coax cable with the center conductor and current on the shield is necessarily a differential mode current. Anything that is imbalanced on a coax cable necessarily travels on the outside of that shield, right? So the inside of the shield has one set of currents and the outside of the shield has a different set of currents. And they are necessarily, the inside is necessarily balanced with the current on the center conductor. Anything that's not balanced will travel on the outside of the coaxial shield. Um, so that's interesting to note. We're going to use that later when we talk about how do we construct a ballon or a, a current choke. So what causes common mode currents? Well, there are many different things that can cause common mode currents, but there are two that we're going to be looking at today. One is an imbalanced antenna. So if you've got a dipole up here, but they're not, it's not perfectly balanced, either because one side's a little bit longer than the other, or it is, um, you know, it's nearer to the house, so it's got some additional loading on it, or it's bent, or whatever. Any sort of a non-perfectly balanced dipole antenna will not consume the currents from this coax perfectly balanced and there will be an imbalance in that current consumption and that current that extra imbalanced current that that is not perfectly being radiated by the antenna is going to get reflected down the outside of your coax because the transceiver is feeding a balanced differential mode current down the center of the coax it's going to go up and hit the antenna and any non-balance on that antenna is going to try and force some of that current back down but the outside of the coax the other common source of common mode currents are, remember how I said this was three wires? The two on the middle of the, of the coax are necessarily uh, balanced wires, but the outside is for common mode currents. And that just looks like a giant wire between your antenna and your transceiver, which is also an antenna. So if that feed line is running near, say, uh, an arcing transformer on the street or um, some cheap LED lighting or uh, your dishwasher or whatever it is that is generating all of this electrical noise, if that coax runs close to that electrical noise source, it's going to pick it up like an antenna. And that power that's coming in on that coax as an antenna is common mode energy because it's not there's no current opposing it the other direction. That's one of the things that an antenna does is that it, it allows both sides of that current to be picked up. When you just have a giant wire like this, it's common mode current. And all of that current, either from your imbalanced antenna or from the RF energy, like the noise, the RFI, is getting picked up on the outside of your coax and it's coming down to your transceiver and it has to have, find a path. And that path ends up going through the power to the ground. And any impedance between the shield of your coax and the ground of your transceiver, and there is some, not a lot, but there's some, any impedance there will end up putting a voltage there. And that voltage is going to be picked up by your transceiver. Um, and that's going to show up as noise in your receiver. And so that's why we want to get rid of these, these common mode currents. Well, how do we get rid of those common mode currents? Well, we want to build a car, cur, common mode current choke, something that will choke off this common mode current. And we'll get into exactly what that looks like electrically in a bit. But right now I want to talk about where do you put them? Well, you would put them at your antenna feed point to balance out your antenna. If you put a choke there, it prevents any unbalanced current going on the outside of your coax. And that forces the currents to be balanced on your antenna. That's why you'll see people recommending you put a one-to-one -one current ballon or a one-to-one -one ballon or a choke 
at the feed point of a dipole antenna. If your dipole antenna is perfect, you don't need it. But dipole antennas are rarely perfect. And so by building this simple choke, this one-to-one -one ballon at the feed point, you can force those currents to be balanced on the antenna and prevent the return, the reflected power. It's different than reflected power because reflected power can also be differential on the inside of the coax. Um, but it forces it to not come down on the outside of your coax. But even if we disconnect this third wire from the antenna up here, I still have that third wire connecting all the way down to the transceiver. So we'll still get the RF energy. We'll still get the noise coming into the transceiver. So the second place you would want to put a choke is right at the input to the transceiver. The choke is basically going to disconnect that wire, that third wire of your coax from the transceiver and stop it acting like an antenna. So putting a common mode choke or a one-to-one -one ballon at your antenna will help balance out your antenna. Putting one here at your transceiver will help eliminate the noise that's picked up on the outside shield of your coax into your transceiver. All right, so what is a common mode choke? How do they work? What are, what are we trying to build here? Well, you have to understand a little bit about inductors, right? You, you, have, you make a coil of wire, and the current flowing through that wire sets up a magnetic field in that wire. And if you've got two wires and you wind them in parallel, then, you know, the sum of those currents are going to set up that magnetic field. And so they both, if they both have currents going the same direction in common mode, in the same direct, in the, in the common direction, then it's the same as like one wire, right? And that's going to set up a magnetic field and that's going to make an inductor. And an inductor is a high impedance to high frequencies and a low impedance to low frequencies. So it will tend to block high frequency energy or RF energy, um, but it will allow DC through. We don't care about that part. The part that we care about is this differential mode. If I've got some current going that way through my coil and other currents going that way through my coil, they're both going to set up their magnetic fields, but in opposite directions. And so their magnetic fields cancel out. So currents that are balanced, differential mode currents going through this inductor um, they cancel each other out, and it's not an inductor. It, there is no magnetic field here. There's nothing there to impede that current. So as long as you have balanced currents going in opposite directions through this differential or through this uh, this choke, it won't even see the choke. It'll just go right on through it. So what this does when you build your chokes this way is it's a it's a magical device. I'll put that in bunny rabbit ears. It's a device that blocks common mode current. It makes a high impedance to common mode current, but it's a very low impedance to differential mode currents. So any current that is perfectly balanced going through this thing doesn't even see it because there's no magnetic field to interact with that inductor. So that's what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be building these inductors out of our feed line. And any common mode current will see the inductor and will be impeded by it. But any differential mode currents will not see the inductor, well, it'll be completely transparent. This applies to both coax and twisted pair and um, uh, window line, you know, any kind of feed line uh, that you want to build. So this is not unique to coax, but it does work on coax and everything else. And all the testing I did was on coax. Okay, the next thing we need to talk about is the nano VNA. This is not a talk about nano VNAs. I'm going to save that topic for people who know way more about VNAs than I do. But there is one thing that's a little bit uncommon to how a lot of people use a VNA um, that I want to bring up, at least touch on. We are very we're very familiar with using just port one on our nano VNA and using it like an antenna tuner, right? It sends a signal out, port one, it hits your load, let's say this is an antenna, and then some of that gets reflected back right? Some of that energy gets reflected back. And the port one is able to generate the signal, but also measure the relative amplitude and phase of that reflected signal. And that's the S11. Um, so out port one and back in on port one. And those are the S11 parameters. We're going to be using the nano VNA for measuring S21 parameters, which is the signal comes out on port one, but we're measuring what's coming back on port two, right? Because we want to measure it through the ballon. 
Um, and those are the S2 one. When you're calibrating this, when you're calibrating the open, short, and load, you're calibra calibrating port one, the reflected power of port one. So you're measuring, you're calibrating the S11 parameters. When you're calibrating the isolation and through parameters, you're calibrating the S2 one. So what is it that we're trying to measure today? Well, I'm going to bring back up my coax diagram. Normally, the nano VNA sticks a signal out on the center conductor and uh, expects the return currents, uh, you know, balanced return currents on the other side. It kind of doesn't do anything with the outside of the coax. So what we need is a device that will take the signal from the nano VNA and put it on the outside or put it on the, on the shield of the coax without putting the balancing current on the center conductor. So we want to take the signal from our nano VNA, unbalance it, make it common mode, not differential mode, and put it on the shield of our coax. Now the nano VNA still needs those return currents to come back. So we connect the shields of the two different ports on the nano VNA together in our test rig. Um, but we want we want the signal going on the outer shield of our coax that we're going to be testing, the ballon, the coax that goes into the ballon of the, that we're testing. So this was the first one that I built. Very simple test rig. It's just a little project box. These are the two ports going off to the nano VNA. You can see the center conductor here goes off to the shield of the PL259, and then from there across to the SMA and the BNC. Uh, so I just put multiple connectors on here so I could test different kinds of cables. But the center conductor of the test input goes off to the shield of these other connectors. And the center conductors on these other connectors are not connected to anything. They're completely disconnected. I only care about the shield of these connectors. Now, I also need the grounds to be connected between the two test ports. So I just got another cable going straight across, right? So this is my build of this. I had a hard time calibrating this because I needed to be able to calibrate the open short and load, you know, to eliminate these, um, the, the test cables and various other things. So I made one enhancement to this test rig and I built a second one. That enhancement that I made was to add a switch, right? So the device under test over here, the, these are the, the three ports, it's four on the new one. Um, this is where you're going to hook up your ballon over here. And then you have a switch that will either short the shield to the center conductor, right? So this is the signal coming from the nano VNA. And we can flip the switch over to the test condition where the shield is connected to that. And in this case, because these currents are going the same direction, no current is flowing on the center pin because there's no reverse current to balance it. All of the current is going in the same direction. So necessarily, because physics... Uh, all of that current is going on the outside of the shield of the coax over here. But alternatively, I can flip the switch the other way. And now the center conductor from the nano VNA goes to the center conductor of this port. And then the shield from the nano VNA goes over to the shield of this port. So this is what I call my through condition. And it's just, you know, coax straight through the test device. And then the same thing on the other side. So what does this look like? I made this a little bit cleaner. I used pre-made cables that I got on eBay. I think I got two of each of these. So like a PL259 to SMA, a BNC to SMA, and an N to SMA. I got two of each of those for each of the halves, and I just cut them in half. And then I used the SMAs from the other side for the, um, excuse me, for the, uh, the SMA test port here and also the port going over to the nano VNA. Um, and then I put the switch in there, and I just tied those four, these four connector cables together, uh, soldered them all together, and put them onto the switch. And then here's the input from the nano VNA going into that switch. So this is my test, the second test rig that I built, and this is the one that I used for all of the measurements that I'm presenting here today. All right, when you use a nano VNA and any VNA, nano or otherwise, calibrating that VNA is always important. It is super important. Um, in our case, you want to test, you want to calibrate this with as much of your test rig in place as possible. So when you're doing your open, short, and load calibrations, um, you need to have the, the center conductor and the ground available, and you want to test as much of that through as possible. So put the 
your test the switches of your test rig in the through mode. So the um, so these ports here are just coax connected directly to the input mode. But when you are testing the isolation and through calibrations, so the port the S21 measurements, when you're calibrating those, it needs to be in test mode. So you're going to stick a cable on it and not connect it on one side, but not on the other side, and you'll test the isolation, and then you'll connect it through to the other side as well, and you'll test the through. And so that needs to be in the test mode on the switch. Once you have it calibrated, make darn sure that your calibration is correct. So you need to validate your calibration. If you test it with the cable completely disconnected, this is what you should see, something like this. I would prefer this to be flatter, but I suspect there's a lot... there. I could do better with my test rig putting some isolation between those two halves. I got no isolation, so there's probably some capacitive coupling between the two halves. Um, and ideally, all of this would be like in a giant shielded chest, test chamber. I did it on my back patio on my patio table, right? So not the best, like I said, not the most scientific in the world, but engineering enough to be able to get some reasonable results. I would love for this to be closer to like minus 80 dB all the way across the band, but this is what we got. Uh, similarly, put a coax directly from the, uh, the across the two test ports, and this one should be very close to zero. Uh, it's a little bit less than, or more loss than zero as you go higher up in frequency because my, my test cable now becomes a significant portion of a wavelength. Um, so it starts becoming a significant portion of the actual circuit. So it's going to have some loss up there at the higher end, around 30 megahertz. Um, but you want to, when you, after you've calibrated, you want to test your calibrations and make sure that your graphs look like this. When the cable is disconnected, you want it to be a whole lot of loss. When the t cable is connected, but with no choke or ballon on it, you want it to be very little loss. So what does good look like? What does good enough look like? Well, we need the more... S21 loss, or the less gain as it's measured, the better. People way smarter than me say that we need at least 1,000 ohms. Um, and then there's a bunch of math that I'm not going to make you sit through. A uh, whole lot of math, blah, blah, blah. The short answer is we're looking for 25 dB of loss or better, um, or a gain of minus 25 dB on the S21 parameters. Um, that is what we would like to see. Now, Total gain or total loss isn't everything, because if you look at this particular one, here's a bit of a sneak peek toward Gordian knots. Um, you know, it's down at minus 40 dB at its best point. So that looks like a great ballon, except for the fact that it's only minus 25 from about 20 megahertz to about 25 megahertz, right? So it's got a relatively narrow uh, frequency rate or bandwidth at the acceptable rates minus 25 dB. Outside of those ranges, it's a pretty rubbish choke. This could be usable, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit in the, in, in the way. But the point is, I'm adding to my definition of good enough that it's minus 25 dB or better across as much of the HF band as possible. So that's what I'm defining as a good ballon. All right, so let's go look at some measurements and take a look at the results. I'm going to lead with the best ballon I have measured. Uh, TLDR, what's the best? The best ballon I could find that I could make with uh, the in the testing time that I had was about 13 turns, give or take, of coax around a toroid. Uh, this one is RG316, so it's uh, you know the little small coax, and there's 13 turns around an FT140, so the 1.4 inch toroids, uh, 43 mix. So FT140-43. Uh, and that's what this graph here is. So there's our minus 25 line. This is minus 30 or better, you know, better than 35 across pretty much the entire HF band. This is uh, 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz over here. So this is a fantastic ballon. Um, this is, I think, 12 turns of RG8X on an FT240 dash 43. So it's a larger co uh, toroid because it's a larger coax. Um, but roughly the same number of turns. It was 12 turns. I think the line on that one was just a few dB above it. Uh, if you, if I didn't already have the connectors on here, I could fit some more turns through there and probably get it down to, to match this one. But if you can wrap coax around a toroid, that is going to be your best bet for a current choke and a one-to-one -one ballon. 
If you can't do that, if you've already got connectors in place uh, or your coax is too stiff to get that kind of a, a, of a tight wrap, the second best that I've been able to find is to build multiple in series. Here I show the graph for two of three turns in what I call a Gordian knot. Uh, each you know, each of these balance, so there are two balance here. There's one here and one here. Each of these is three turns with a ferrite clamp on on the three. Eh, two and a half turns because it's it's three turns through the ferrite, but it's only two turns over here. So two and a half turns, three turns because it's three going through the ferrite. You build two of these in series, and that's a darn good balance. It's better than 25 across the entire band, down to about 32, 33, 32 and a half uh, at its best. And if you added a third one in series here, you could probably get this down to the level of where the toroid was. And you can do that. There's no, you don't have to feed these through, you know, big connectors through tiny holes in ferrites because these are clamp on. So if you've got enough coax, you can just twist the these turns and put the clamp-ons on them. Clamp-ons come in as large, the largest one I found was a one-inch inner diameter, and you can pretty easily fit three turns of uh, LMR 400 through through these kinds of clamp-ons, and you get similar, similar results. Um, and so putting two or three of these in series makes a darn good ballon, or a darn good current choke. All right. So those are the TLDRs. What are the two best? The toroids and then these uh, multiple Gordian knots in series. So let's go look in some more detail. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at Gordian knots because when you got coax, that is like the easiest ballon to make, right? Well, I kind of spoiled earlier. When you have too many turns in your Gordian knot, you end up with this very resonant graph. The problem here is, yeah, I've got lots of inductance, but I've also got lots of capacitance. There's a lot of mutual capacitance uh, between those turns. And that inductance and capacitance together make a resonant circuit. And that resonant circuit is great at blocking RF at the resonant frequency. That's why this is down at minus 40 dB. It's better than our reference for a very narrow bandwidth, right? And outside of that bandwidth, it gets a lot worse because of that resonance. Um, so let's take a look at the progression of different numbers of turns of Gordian knots. Uh, this is two turns of a Gordian knot. This is three turns. It looks a little bit better. The shape is a little bit better. Uh, kind of, It starts to flatten out here a little bit, but it's still only, you know, minus 10 dB at its best point. Uh, four turns is it's better rejection at the high end, but you'll notice that it's starting to slope down. You're starting to see that resonance, right? As you get more turns, you get add more capacitance, and it becomes more resonant. But by the time we hit five turns, we've got that resonance spike, and you can actually see it inside the HF band. And then six turns was the previous one that we looked at. Um, this one is resonant, what, about 22 megahertz? Uh, that was six turns. This is five turns. It's up around 25 megahertz, right? So as you add more, it gets a little bit deeper, but the 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 resonant point moves down in frequency. So is that useful? Could be. If you've got a monoband antenna and a monoband system, and you want to make a, a current choke that is targeted for that one band, and you can take the time to either calculate Gordian knots are very hard to calculate mutual capacitance, but fiddle with the geometry. How many turns? How big of a circle do you make? Um, do you make multiples of them and put them in series? If you take the time to fiddle with that, you can make an amazingly effective ballon for one band, and it'll be rubbish everywhere else. But for that one band, it'll be great. So you could do that if you want to. I'm more interested in a wide band current choke. So looking at these shapes, three turns kind of looks the best. That's right before it starts getting super resonant, um, but it's more loss than the two turns. So that's why I used the three turns on the next step that I'm going to go to. So what happens if we start adding ferrites to those? Those were all just turns of coax with no ferrites. Well, here is the graph, the same graph from the previous slide, two turns, no ferrites, same graph that we just saw. Here is the exact same Gordian knot, but I add one of those Mix 31 clamp-ons on it. It's hard to tell here because it rescaled this, and I couldn't figure out how to get Nano Nano VNA Saver to fix that scale at my, at zero at the top. 
But here, it's starting out at minus 13, and it gets down to about minus 20 at its best spot. Uh, whereas here, it started out at zero, and at its best spot, it was minus 10. So here, it's starting out at its you know, better than the worst spot on this graph. So this is a much more effective ballon just by adding that one ferrite clamp on because we've taken that inductor in the coax and that ferrite greatly increases the inductance without adding any more capacitance. So it makes it more effective as a, uh, as a ballon. Uh, so let's look at, so that's two turns. Let's look at three turns. Okay, so three turns without any ferrite. We we resonated up here around third or twenty eight megahertz, and now we've moved that resonant frequency down to about twelve megahertz. But it's also much lossier, much more rejection. Right here, the best spot is about minus nine, minus ten dB. Down here, we're almost we're at minus twenty five, right? And the worst spot, we're at minus seventeen. So just by adding that one ferrite to this three turn Gordian knot we're getting it a lot closer to our reference line down here, right? So if we look at four turns, now that capacitance is starting to come back and bite us. That four turns of that Gordian knot is now making this ballon super resonant, m way more resonant than we want it to be. Over here with no ferrites, the resonance was off the chart, you know, so above 30 megahertz, but here it's inside our HF band and we can see where it is. And then, of course, with five turns, as you would expect, that resonance frequency keeps moving down lower. Um, and, you know, but the loss is also getting better. So five turns with no ferrites and five turns with a ferrite. The ferrite adds to the inductance, and that changes the, the resonance point. But if we look at this three turns, this is really kind of the shape that I want. That's as close to the shape, the kind of the ideal shape that we can find. So let's... Can I take two of those and put them in series and improve the uh, the overall performance? And they have, of course, the answer is yes. And so here's one three turns of RG8X with a mixed 31 clamp on, and here's two three turns of RG8X with a mixed 31 clamp on. And so this is, you know, between minus 18 down to about minus 25 and then back up again to minus uh, 17 or so. Here, we're better than minus 25 all the way across the band. So we have improved by 5 to 10 dB the rejection just by building a second one and adding it in series to the first one. You'll also note that it looks, not a lot, but it looks a little bit less resonant. Um, you know, the, the kind of the difference between the bottom point and the top point here is nine, 8 or 9 dB, whereas here it's... Eh, uh, yeah, no, that's better. That's, so this one here, it's like about 5 dB. Um, we're seeing a very interesting fact by having two balance in series. The reason two balance in series improves the resonance, makes it less resonant, flattens out that curve, is because you've got two inductors in series, and two inductors in series will always add their inductance but you've also got two capacitors in series now. And those two capacitors in series divide their capacitance. So you are skewing your resonance more toward inductance and less capacitance. And it's, it's making it more of a pure inductance system. And the pure inductance system, I think, has a lower Q. I, I'm, now we're getting into a little bit more science, but it's, it's more looking like an ideal inductor and less of, you know, a little bit of, of um, parasitic capacitance in there. And that ends up flattening out your curve. So the more of these balance you add in series with each other, not only does it lower the overall graph, but it also flattens it out and makes it a better um, balance over the entirety of the HF band. This is why I say don't do more than three turns in each of these balance. More turns is better, right? Not necessarily, because you also get the more capacitance. So build multiple loops with only three turns each and put one clamp on on each of those and just build multiple of those in series. So what does this device actually look like? I think I showed this picture a little bit earlier, right? So it's literally just two loops with you know three passing through this center here and a clamp on on it. 
and then it goes around to another loop, another three loops with a clamp on on it, and then back in. And if I had a longer cable, I could have made and tested a, a third loop here. I just didn't have enough cable for it. And that would have brought this line down probably close to this blue line and made them very comparable. So this is why I like this Gordian knot design as uh, my second best Ballon. It's better than 25 across all of HF, and it's super simple to build. That brings me to the end of this presentation. I'd like to hear from you what Ballons you like. Uh, and ideally, you would build one of these test rigs and build a Ballon and measure it and see how it actually performs, uh, and then tweak it and see if you can improve it. That's just like I did with the Gordian knots. You know, I, I measured the different numbers of turns and figured out which one had the best shape, and then I tried lots of different clamp-ons. I tried doing two clamp-ons on, on each one of those loops, or three clamp-ons. Uh, I tried, like, putting the coils next to each other and clamping one clamp-on on both turns, and, you know, I tried lots of different things that I didn't have time to show in this particular presentation, I only showed the ones that ended up working the best, but there are a lot, there's a lot of things that you can do and play with to adjust how of these balance work. And with this test rig, you can measure those results directly and, and say authoritatively, this one works better than this one. So I'm going to keep working on this design. Um, I'd like to see what you come up with. Do you have a favorite Ballon design that I didn't cover here uh, that you would love to see measured? Please do it, and then send me the results. Let me know what you come up with. Again, my name's Mark Smith, N6MTS, uh, Smitty Halibut on Twitter, and uh, up here are the results of the measurements that I took and the links to the actual scientific resources if you want to talk to people that are smarter than me about this or read what they have to say. Thank you very much for coming to my presentation, and I will take some questions now.